car into her funeral business office in Jedburgh. David Noakes has the details. William McBurney had been in a relationship with Zoe Turnbull for close to two years, but in the months after she broke it off in June 2022, the 57-year-old bombarded her with abusive messages and phone calls. He was already on a bail undertaking to leave her alone when, on the afternoon of Wednesday, December the 7th, the former policeman drove at high speed through the front window of Zoe's funeral business offices in Jedburgh. The vehicle narrowly missed both 46-year-old Zoe and her 71-year-old mother Beverly. Yesterday at the High Court in Livingston, McBurney was warned by Judge Lord Mulholland that he can expect to go to prison for a lengthy period when he's sentenced on September the 19th. Former Scotland rugby captain Stuart Hogg is today facing charges of domestic abuse, stalking and controlling behaviour towards his estranged wife Gillian at a trial in Jedburgh. The 32-year-old, who made a play and come back at the weekend in France, denies a total of three charges which date back to his playing days in Glasgow and Exeter, as well as at the former family home in Hoyk. He's also due to be sentenced on a charge of breaching a bail condition earlier this year by contacting his former partner. A proposed mountain bike centre in Innerleithen, which is expected to create more than 400 jobs, is hanging in the balance after major structural problems were discovered. Planning permission has already been granted for the £20 million centre at Curley Mill, but conversion work on the on the 230-year-old listed building was halted during the summer after engineers concluded that large parts were beyond repair. Options, now including demolishing and rebuilding as well as relocating, are now being examined. Project leads at Scottish Borders Council, South of Scotland Enterprise and Napier University are organising a public meeting on Monday, September 23rd and local MP David Mundell wants assurances on the project's future. I want to see both a mountain bike innovation centre and I want to see the Carley Mill refurbished. The ideal outcome would have been for the mountain bike centre to be in the Carley Mill but if that isn't going to be possible, we need to get an assurance that we'll get both the mountain bike centre in Inner Leithen, which is so vital to the local economy and the development of mountain biking in the area, and that the Carly Mill will be fully refurbished if for some other purpose. South of Scotland Enterprise say they remain committed to delivering the centre. Nine public halls across the borders are set for renovation and upgrading, with executive councillors today being asked to approve £218,000 worth of funding. The work includes £80,000 for new seating, carpeting and decor for the Tate Hall in Kelso, along with £40,000 for similar improvements at Selkirk's Victoria Hall and £45,000 for the Volunteer Hall in Gala Shields. Other buildings set to benefit are the Corn Exchange in Melrose, Hoyk Town Hall, the Heart of Hoyk, Inner Leithen's Memorial Hall, Old Gala House and Stow Town Hall. Now, the head of the South of Scotland Golden Eagle project believes their work is not finished, despite its funding being about to run out. The project has, over the past six years, helped re-establish the iconic species across the borders and Dumfries and Galloway, and is seeking to widen their work. Dr Kat Barlow. We've been funded by the Heritage Luffy Project and, and our other partners over the last kind of five, six years, which has been fantastic, but that funding is coming to an end soon. And we feel like we're, we're just not finished with the job that we wanted to do. Um, we've had fantastic success with Golden Eagle numbers rising. We've got you know really great population here in the south of Scotland now. But we want to try and expand that beyond south of Scotland and start looking into to English skies. Sport Now and the coach of cyclist Oscar Onley believes he has the talent to challenge for the sport's Grand Tours. After the 21-year-old from Kelso followed up a 39th place in his debut Tour de France with second in the Tour of Britain. Oscar's coach is former Dutch champion Pim Ligart. Where he is in his process and where he is in his career at this moment, he learns from everyone. So he learns when we go into a bunch sprint how to uh, react, how to behave, how to position himself, how to help his teammates. But he also learns when he's going as a leader into yeah, a stage race like this or Tour of Swiss or whatever. He's in the progress still of learning and I think he's yeah, doing that really well. And you can also see he's making the steps. Finally in racing, Jedburgh jockey Callum Bewley rode steps match to a win at Perth yesterday. Well done to Callum. Now with the Borders weather, here's Julian Smart.
Good morning to you. Today will be cool and windy with a mixture of sunny spells, patchy cloud and a few blustery showers. Highs of 11 to 14 Celsius with strong west-northwesterly winds. Tonight will be breezy and chilly, plenty of clear spells, but still the odd shower feeding in from the northwest. And lows 2 to 5 Celsius. Tomorrow will start mainly dry with plenty of sunshine. And then a mix of sunny spells, patchy cloud and blustery showers will follow for the afternoon. Windy again. Well, a bit of a mixed picture there. We'll have more news from the borders at half past 12. But now back to Laura and Gary. And good morning, Scotland. On digital radio. FM. Your smart speaker. And on BBC Sounds. BBC Radio Scotland. You're listening to Good Morning Scotland. It's 24 minutes to nine. Scotland's former first ministers appear to be draggers, daggers drawn this morning. They've been trading blows on a new BBC Scotland documentary. It's called Sabbath and Sturgeon, A Troubled Union. The programme features an interview with Hamza Yousaf, who suggests that Alex Salmond was guilty of abusing his power during his time in office. Mr Salmond still has his allies within the party, among them the SNP MP, MSP Fergus Ewing, who's with us now. Good morning to you. Good morning, Gary. Um, we'll come to what Hamza Yousaf's saying in just a moment, but let's deal with some of the claims that you've been making about what you describe as being a, a scandal, a, the greatest political scandal of your lifetime. Uh, there are legal constraints around some of this, but um, what, in essence, are you alleging? Well, there was um, a concerted campaign led by the Permanent Secretary of the Scottish Government, the top civil servant, to destroy Alex Salmond, uh, first in the civil proceedings, and then uh, by concocting a method to find him uh, pursued, pursued in the criminal courts, ultimately aiming to have him jailed. Uh, this was a despicable act. And I base my claims, um, Gary, on, on three main things. Firstly many documents which are in the public domain and they have been on the excellent Wings Over Scotland website under the Gorton Dangerfield blog. Much of it has been hidden though by the Scottish Government even now which begs the question what have they got to hide? Two, uh, three other sources, uh, Leslie Evans herself, the Permanent Secretary, after being trounced, trounced by Alex Salmond in the court uh, and after Lord Pentland said that the actions of the Scottish Government, and I quote, this is Lord Pentland, one of the top judges in Scotland, he said that the civil service in Scotland was tainted by apparent bias. But does that shock in judgment? <laughs> now, what did Leslie Evans say when she got that? Did she say, let's reflect on this? We've got some serious questions to ask herself. No, what she said was, and this I think was almost immediately, if not the same day, she said, the battle was lost, but not the war. We have a permanent secretary declaring war uh, on a first minister. Lastly, the Scottish Government's own lawyer, Roddy Dunlop QC, said that the failure of Leslie Evans' team to reveal documents, which should have been produced at the very beginning, but weren't until just after the end, actually, or near the end, said, was, quotes, unexplained and inexplicable. And of one of the key top civil servants who produced the draft affidavit, he said this, mercifully, and I quote, mercifully, this document was never lodged as evidence. Now, what inference can you draw from that? Nic Only the gravest inference, I am afraid. Nicola Sturgeon so says the idea of uh, anyone in her government conspiring against Alex Salmond is absurd. Uh, what, what would be the justification, if you're right, about this conspiracy? Well, I'm dealing in facts and evidence, Gary, and I've just chosen a few of them. There's, there's, as you would expect, an awful lot more. But as Lord Pentland indicated when he said that there appeared to be apparent bias against Alex Salmon, there appears to be an animus against Alex Salmon on the part of a group of civil servants. Uh, now, they say, and this is still the position to this day, and I understand that this is Nicholas Sturgeon's position, uh, that Nicholas Sturgeon knew nothing about this until long after these events, until um, uh, I believe it was uh, uh, it was 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 April 2018. Is that these credible to you? Occurred, these accounts occurred before that. Hang on a second. So to answer your question, I mean, one theory which makes it even worse for the civil service is that Nicholas Sturgeon knew nothing about this, and this was their own campaign. 
There is another explanation which is uh, more sinister, and I'm not going to go into that today because, as I say, I deal in facts and evidence. I've been a lawyer for, practicing lawyer for 20 years and an MSP for 25 years, and I owe it to my friends and my foes alike, Gary, to try to get my facts right. Uh, and I think that's the right approach. Well, need and facts are one thing, but I suppose it's the conclusions that we reach as a result of, of, of those facts. The former First Minister Hamza Youssef in this new documentary is accusing Alex Salmond of abusing his power while in office. It does seem as though, for whatever reason, the former First Minister, Mr Salmond, made quite a few enemies. Well, Alex Salmond is, is a strong leader, and uh, in my view... Is that a euphemism? Well, I'm just going to give you my view, uh, uh, Gordon, uh, 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 Gary, that's all I can do. Um, in my view, and, and I think the facts again prove, prove this, Alex Salmon was not only a strong leader and one who impressed with having a mastery of the economy and doing good things for Scotland, but he also led the SNP to its most successful results ever in our history in 2007 and 2011, and very nearly to independence. By contrast, his successors, and I'm afraid particularly Hamza, have seen us rush towards the biggest election defeat and humiliation since uh, in 50 years. But does it matter so, how you get to that result? Because at the end of the day, Hamza Youssef is saying Alex Salmond abused his power while in office. And we know from the criminal case, Mr Salmond, of course, uh, was cleared of all the charges against him. But he did uh, admit to, to some actions whilst in office that some people would have seen as inappropriate. Uh, we've heard in this documentary from Linda Fabiani, for instance, about being tearful, having left meetings with him because of the way he talked to him. Uh, you need a strong leader. You don't need a shrinking violet. Who amongst us, Gary, is perfect? Can I just finish by saying this? 30 years ago, I asked the late Tam Diel for advice. Uh, and he said, Fergus, in any campaign, get your facts right. Hamza wasn't actually in the room that he's talking about. He's basing his comments on hearsay. Well, it's not I hearsay. Said, he's basing some of his comments on some of the things that Mr. Salmon did admit in court, of course, as well. Uh, uh, well, it's it's up to Alex Salmon to speak for himself, uh, but I think the record will show that Alex Salmon was a strong leader, respected by the vast majority of people in Scotland, whose reputation is uh, entirely intact after he was acquitted and after he was hounded by a concerted campaign of a series of actions which is all documented on Wings for Scotland, but which, some of which remains hidden, even after yesterday, Gary, in a, in a hugely significant event, which I haven't heard reported so widely, which is that the Freedom of Information Commissioner, David Hamilton, has yet again decided that the Scottish Government ha uh, were wrong to conceal documents relating to the Hamilton report into Nicola Sturgeon's conduct. And now the Scottish Government must decide, are you going to be honest and share the whole truth with the public. Because if you don't, and you continue to perpetuate a cover-up, which has been criticized by the likes of the top legal uh, eminent lawyers in Scotland, then there is only one further route for the party, and that is down. How, well, let me ask you just finally about the party, just briefly, if you wouldn't mind. I mean, how much of a fissure is this causing within the SNP? What, what effect is it having on you? You're losing friendships over this? <sighs> Gary, you don't go into politics to make friends. You go into politics to try to make a difference for your country. Mr Ewing, thank you very much indeed for speaking to us this morning. That's the SNP MSP for this year. The time now, a quarter to nine, and research has found that more of us are using online services for our news ahead of TV bulletins for the first time. The broadcast regulator Ofcom found 70% of us still rely on the telly, 71% of us are using websites and apps. It's a slim lead, but it's a lead nonetheless. Well, joining us now are journalists from two different generations. The first is John McClellan, who's a former editor of The Scotsman. And we're also joined by Carla Jenkins, who's the social media journalist for The Times Scotland. Good morning to both of you. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. morning. Um, John, I'm not going to ask you how old you are, but you're the former editor of The Scotsman. <laughs> um, you'll have seen a few changes. Too, thank you. Say again. <laughs> 62, thank you. Well, you'll have seen a few changes over the years. 
Yeah, I mean, the, the, the smartphone has changed everything in you know, all, all kinds of communication landscapes. Uh, and the, the Ofcom report um, re reflects some, some detailed research done by the Reuters Institute last year, which, which showed that uh, on average, you know, certainly younger people are, are using something like 22 different sources of, of news information. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and it's not going back. You know, I, I think that's the thing. It's, it's, it's not, a, it shouldn't be, it's not a, a debate about what can we do about this. It's, 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 it's how do we you know, mould and, and protect real trusted and reliable services and sources to match the reality of the modern communications landscape. Um, Carla, have you been a journalist for long? Because when I started out, social media journalism wasn't a thing that existed because there was no social media. <laughs> yes, I've been a journalist since around 2018 when I first started um, at my local newspaper doing freelance and kind of have progressed through uh, the years. I've worked as a Facebook community reporter um, for the Glasgow Times and now I worked as a live reporter for uh, Glasgow Live, which was all online. We didn't have a paper component um, and now I work for the Times Scotland. So in a short time, I've ran through lots of different <laughs> digital roles and seen how it's changed. And uh, just in terms of of your experience, which actually, compared to all of us, is vastly more you're vastly more experienced in the, in the world of online journalism than any of us. Um, how would you say it's changed? And and a lot of us would would question sometimes about the sources that, that, that you know young people are getting their news from when it's online. How do, how would you view it? Yes, I do agree um, that it's changed. Even in the short few years where I've been working in journalism, it has changed. You know, when I started um, at the local newspaper, social media was almost an afterthought. It was something that we put our stories out to uh, get so our readers could, could see it for the visibility. And now it's something that we rely on. It's your shop window, essentially, and you reach audiences who you would never previously have reached. And a part of that audience is reaching younger people. And I, I completely understand people's nervousness about um, people's nerves around the trustworthiness and, and how much uh, we are consuming and how much of that really is kind of legitimate and valid. Um, and what I would always say to people is it's important to remember if you're seeing social media from a news source, so if you're seeing a story from the Times Scotland, all of our social media assets and things like that have been legal in the same way that our stories are legal because they're just as important to get right. And um, having that sense of kind of accuracy and having factual reporting online is just as important to us however obviously we've seen in recent years with you know the cases such as Jay Slater and the death of Nicola Bully how actually news kind of online news mm. is reaching people far and wide and it's not necessarily coming from traditional journal sources and that's what's worrying and that's what's needing to be yeah. more regulated I would agree with. Um, John I suppose that from one point of view we see from this Ofcom research that the use of newspapers is in long-term decline but actually what Car Carla's talking about is essentially those newspapers moving online. Most of my online news consumption mm -hmm. is, with, is with newspapers, yeah. but they're, it's their online yeah. apps, isn't it, John? Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that's right. Yeah. Also, the, I mean, the report does flag up that some of the, the online sources are also linking to um, traditional sites. So that there's, you know, there's an indirect route, route back to um, uh, you know, your trusted media. I think, I think this, it's a very good point that, that, that what the, the Reuters research also showed was that um, when people using so many different sources when something important happens they do go back to a trusted source to try and to, to make sure it's validated and um, i just to ask you about one thing that it struck me yesterday and i'd love to hear both mm. your views on it um was the way that the palace put out yeah. the news about the princess of wales because it strikes me that wasn't aimed at newspapers it wasn't a, a statement it was aimed straight at social media was it carla I would totally agree that it was aimed um, not only just at social media, but it was aimed at the public. And we saw something completely groundbreaking. We saw a really intimate look, um, which was a visual look. Um, and I think this taps into everything that every traditional news outlet is doing now. People are consuming their news vertically. They're consuming it on a multimedia platform. They're wanting to see things, hear things. They want to sort of be entertained. And 